Okay, so, yeah, so it's all the Zoom is all, all hooked up. Okay, so we're, we're happy today um, to have uh, Glennis Farrar uh, visiting us. And uh, Glennis uh, was a student of Sam Tremaine. Freeman. Freeman. And, yeah. and uh, who was a student of Fermi, so your granddaughter of. Uh, um, and uh, did your graduate work at Princeton, stayed there as a postdoc before moving to Caltech as postdoc and faculty to Rutgers, and she's been at uh, NYU for 20 some years. And uh, she's an expert on uh, strong interactions, hadronic physics, um, uh, a little bit of trivia that. Uh, She's had, uh, I looked, I tried to look today, uh, over 300 papers written about a footnote in one of her papers. Uh, our parody violation was mentioned in your footnote with, uh, in a footnote in your paper with Pierre. And so that's, of course, a big subject in supersymmetric theories. Uh, that was one of the, actually one of the first phenomenology papers on in supersymmetry back in, uh, I won't say that. Uh, huh? The very first phenomenology. Right. And, and so the, the whole idea of our parody and our symmetry is mentioned or introduced in that paper. And then as a footnote, oh, it should be violated in the gravity. Anyway, it's very uh, amusing to see it in a footnote and having spawned an industry. Um, so today she'll talk about uh, missed resonances uh, from precision plus and minus. Uh, evidence for uh, sex accord dark matter. Hi, uh, it's really nice to be here. It's been decades since I had been, but I will repair that and come and visit often. Um, the talk today, and tell me if I need amplification of this is okay. Um, it's a kind of meandering in a way, and the reason is partly because that's the wonderful and life giving part of physics, that pursuing one thing may turn out not to be working out the way you were hoping or expected, but you get some new idea or insight. And so this talk will have a little bit of that character. Um, the kind of overview I have in mind is to argue, actually, that there can be a stable hadron that we have not found. We just never noticed it. And furthermore, it's called sexochord and it's made of three up, two downs, and three strange. And if they're in an extremely compact state, the idea that there would be strong binding in that channel was noticed in the context of the bag model by um, Jaffe in the 80s. Um, but he was envisioning a very extended state whose size was something like two Fermi lots of enons. And um, if you, in that case, that possibility is totally excluded. I could go into it, this observation of this general physics. So, possibility that I want to point to is that actually there is a very compact state whose size is maybe 0.3 families. And that, and that's a very special state 
this this combination of two ups, two downs, and two strange with red, yellow, and green, whatever colors, means that it can be in a totally anti-symmetric state and be spatially symmetric. And that's unique among uh, six quark states. I mean, so a neutron, for example, is two very broadly separated uh, have variants, for example, a neutron with a big separation. The possibility of all sitting at one point in a very compact system is not possible with other members. Um, and that fact, if it exists, would mean that it will have evaded all the experimental searches, as I will describe. And I'll mention again, sort of briefly, that if it exists, it's actually quite a great dark matter candidate. You can estimate its relic abundance with no free parameters because it's a QCD particle. And so, modulo our understanding in detail the transition from a quark gluon plasma. So it had run. Everything else about the theory, like effective strong couplings and things like that, are known. And so you can do an estimate of the, the relic abundance, and you just get the right order of magnitude. Actually, that's better than the right order of magnitude. That's sort of got an order of magnitude uncertainty. But so a question here, like maybe you're gonna say this, but why does it why doesn't it decay? Because it's light. Well, I'll, I'll, I will come back You'll to that. To but that. Okay. I should answer yeah. it. It's because the idea is that if its mass is in the range from about two proton masses to around two, two GeV, then it's too light to decay with a lifetime shorter than the age of the universe. Uh, but you, but a you, crucial point I should have mentioned. But you'll get to it, yeah. yeah no, but I'm very glad you mentioned it. It's an important oversight of giving an overview. Because normally with the strange quarks, you would estimate a mass of like 2.2 GeV, roughly twice the lambda mass, just like the deuteron is essentially the same mass as the proton plus the neutron. But the idea is because it can live in this very special anti-symmetric state and be very much more compact, it can be deep in the potential well, which we actually understand from the Cornell potential growth. Anyway, it's a possibility. It's uh, and it turns out that lattice gauge theory, all of the lattice gauge experiments to date are very, very far from being able to probe this regime. Just writing a paper on that with uh, Petro Hatsuda of the Hawk UCD group and uh, Gordon Bain. Okay. Um, and then talking about this strange cat, I'm going to talk about the muon anomalous magnetic moment. Partly, I will dwell on that more than one would normally because it's so charming to me and impressive the experimental approaches. So I share that with you all. Um, and then I'm going to tell you what, what got to me on this circuitous path was realizing actually that the existence of living sex support might account for why the standard model prediction as it's been made, could be wrong. You know that the standard model prediction um, up until recently at least was 4.2 sigma different from the experimental value. Um, and so I will talk about how that could be reconciled by existence of overlooked neutral headruns. And then the big highlight of today is new work uh, looking at this channel with very high precision data just done, and we about to post the paper with uh, Tang Zhen Wan about the BES collaboration in Beijing. Um, and remarkably, it seems <laughs> on the surface of it, it shows very clear evidence of two previously not known about resonance. Okay, so that's the overview. Um, the general idea, um, I'm just uh, we can touch on a little bit is that because of the fact that you can have three different, six different states, I thought I did this before. How do you, ah, um, you can put it, make it anti-symmetric, and I'm calling it an S to distinguish it from this H dibaryon that because it's so different. Um, if its mass is in this range, uh, it's effectively stable because it would have to decay through a double weak interaction. It can't be very much less than that 
or else new neurons that would decay to it. So its mass range is fairly well restricted. Um, it's got zero spin, zero charge, variant number two, and strange is minus two. Um, a very important phenomenological aspect is that because it's a flavor singlet, right? All of the hadrons we know are not flavor singlets, well, they're eight of times, but the baryons we know are all flavor octets or decuplets um, or excited states. And the fact that it's a flavor singlet makes this phenomenology very different because, right, the strongly interacting low energy behavior of baryons comes largely because they can exchange pions with other particles. And um, but because a pion is a flavor octet, you can't have a flavor singlet emit a flavor octet and say a flavor singlet. So this, it really uh, transforms its behavior. So this is the picture of the S, this very compact, this radius of a neutron or lambda is a border uh, 0.8 or so Fermi, and here's the radius I don't think I do it very well. The scale is around 0.2 Fermi. And this picture uh, kind of conveys why it would be exceedingly hard to transform between, even though quantum numbers permit the S to transform into two lambdas when with an added weak interaction or something, it, it could decay. Or in a scattering process where things are off shell, so you're not worrying about energy conservation. You, it would still be a very small effective coupling because the quark states have to fluctuate into this totally different geometrical configuration, right? You have to do a wave function overlap between the initial and final states. So the inherent uh, coupling or the, the conversion uh, amplitude between an S and uh, two baryons is extremely small. Uh, another feature of it that makes it hard to have found, um, if it exists, I always have to make a caveat, is that it's neutral and its mass is around three dB. So it's a lot like a neutron that maybe just has a smaller scattering at cross section because it, because of the fact it doesn't exchange ions. But in, in high energy collider experiments like with the LHC, you'd expect a tremendous production of these things. I once calculated the total number that I think would have been recorded or in recorded events, um, like an Atlas and CMS. And it was like a million or something. But the fact is, it just, it's just there, surrounded by hundreds of other particles. And it's neutral, and it doesn't do much. If occasionally it scatters, well, stuff happens. Anyway, so the, the key to why it wouldn't have been noticed is, is this guy. What, I was just, what prevents the, just the weak decay into two neutrons? Well, it's a doubly weak, it has to be a doubly weak process because you have to change right. two. Right, that's right. But, but then, so then you calculate this. The reason that's, a, it's not zero if, if there's enough mass for it, but then, the, um, then there's this overlap factor. And the overlap factor, this right, because the geometric overlap of the two neutron state and this very compact state is just extremely small. I'll, I'll come back to the slide. Okay. It's a little bit better. But you're right, that would be a decay. All right. Yeah, I understand it would be doubly weak. And then you got, I don't know, yeah, 60. The weakness only takes you down to the lifetime of hours or days. Or right. Months. That's what I would have. And, but then you got six body final state or something, I guess. Well, you have to integrate over the uh, overlap of the quarks to the this very compact state to fluctuate to this totally different state. I think there's a slide doing showing that calculation. Maybe, okay. yeah. But how do you know the mass is in that range? Though? Well, it's see so how do you predict the mass in QCD? The, it's not easy. No, no, no. But it's more. Uh, a lot of the what I'm saying is deduced from what would be necessary for this to be done. Oh, I if see. If it's too much, so you know it's going to be in that range. I see. So it's kind of just based on what we know about if it if it's if it's an existing state at all, it's yeah. lighter than two lambdas. And then I'm going to show you if it's too much lighter, less than around two nucleon masses, roughly 1850 is more like the number. 
then it would decay and boomerangs would decay and so on. Yes. Um, so it's a combination of you know what we can exclude and what we would expect. Yes. Okay, so there were lots of searches for this H. Vibarian that when you go through them in detail, none of them are applicable. Um, I'm going to also breeze by these and I can come back if people are interested. But I was just saying, why is it so hard to find it? Uh, why wouldn't it already have been noticed? Well, for example, um, one strategy that was used looking for the H was of some exclusive reaction. Where it's easy to identify lambdas and anti lambdas. And if you had a K on B, for example, then you would be able to find this by missing X. Um, and similarly, an epsilon decay and so on. Um, but the trouble is, these are highly suppressed because of this overlap factor of exhaustion. Um, there are other, other, there's one experiment from Babar looking for this channel where the S is unseen. And so you just see a missing two anti lambdas or a missing two lambdas. Um, and they put a limit of 10 to minus seven, but in earlier papers where I had proposed this, I pointed out that if you have to do an exclusive channel, the estimated limit would be more like 10 to minus 11. Bell right now is trying to do this without demanding that there's no other. But basically, when you look at the um, all of the final channels in the C plus C minus or epsilon final state, all the ones with a small number of hadrons are suppressed by X. Factors of 10 to the fourth or 10 to the fifth relative to ones with lots of accompanying ions. Uh, it's kind of intuitively reasonable. It's, it's just a very much more, given the 10 GeV center of mass energy, it's natural that that would be calculated with a lot. Anyway, so Bell is now trying to do it without demanding this being an exclusive. They have a limit, but um, from Bell on the H production, where the H decays this way, um, but that's only applicable if, if the thing is, is a lot heavier. Uh, so I'm, I wrote a paper in which I outlined some promising strategies at the LHC and, and the lung and that the neutral particle detector. Then I'm going to skip over that again at the end. I'll be happy to um, talk about that. Um, one of the people at CERN who's doing an experiment to look for it, made this uh, nice uh, <laughs> meme, I guess we'll call it. I'm not good at these things. OK, so I'm going to shift gears and talk about, um, because this is just motivation, really, of what would be the cosmology and astrophysics of uh, a dark matter particle at the um, So this is. Uh, type of thought that people make coming in part from direct detection experiments. Most of these regions here that are excluded uh, are experiments like XQC was a uh, rocket-born 100-second measurement looking for diffuse x-rays. You know, it's an astrophysics experiment, but they indirectly take the limit. These are pressed as another experiment that was originally done as a surface run. Um, and these are exclusions from requiring, the, the, let's say this, this region is a, I can't remember, I think it's a cross hatch region. Uh, we could, this is work with a student of mine, we could exclude by the knowledge that dark matter doesn't bind to helium, otherwise in the early universe when the synthesis was happening, all of the helium essentially would have uh, bound up and we would be measuring helium as having a mass of let's say six instead of two and so on. The region you would expect it to live because it's a hadron, you'd expect this cross section to be roughly speaking in the 10 mil, you know, a tenth of a millibar to a mil, 10 millibar range. Um, and so it, it, this is largely not constrained. Until recently, I was sorry that um, Hasala uh, wasn't here because I was eager to look, uh, try to stuff with him the following thing. 
he and others proposed an ingenious way. The problem with the dark matter detection experiment is in, in this lighter masses is that the with a, the, the typical dark matter is got a typical velocity in our galaxy, which is about 300 kilometers a second. So that's 10 to the minus three times C. And that means that the kinetic energy as the mass of the dark matter particle is getting smaller and smaller, this kinetic energy gets really very small. And so in this sort of this range of interest here, to GED dark matter particle, the amount of kinetic energy it's carrying is of order of KeV. And then when it scatters off some nucleus like silicon in the detector, the amount of energy it deposits is you know, maybe a factor of 30 smaller. And so the problem of the detection is just go below the threshold. So that's why for years there was very little constraints on this region. But um, due to work with Pontoff and others, um, people realized that you could, that just because there are cosmic rays in the galaxy, sometimes they'll scatter off dark matter, give it a lot more energy. So instead of carrying a KeV of energy, it's carrying tens of KeV perhaps. And then it's got enough energy, maybe, to be able to penetrate the Earth. And the, the, the surface experiments weren't uh, sensitive enough because it's a very small fraction of the dark matter that they get there. But the dark matter that has got up scattered, if it gets through the Earth down to the xenon one ton experiment, Xenon 110 is superbly sensitive and places very strong limits. So in this regime, if the cross-section isn't too big, right, because if the cross-section is big or it's inelastic, then the dark matter loses too much energy before it gets to xenon. So there's a sort of sweet spot which xenon can, xenon 110 can exclude when the cross-section is small enough that it um, that, that it can get through down to it, or when it loses not too much energy. So potentially this range could be excluded. I actually think that, um, and was hoping to discuss with him, that in the present analysis, uh, it's not this sensitive to, to reasons of not treating properly the hadronic physics. That, so that's sort of up in the air. So this is the constraints that I was referring to on the map that I was going to get to. And um, so what this plot shows, a very busy looking plot, but I'll explain it better. This is a function of hypothetical mass of the, of the state versus this coupling parameter I'm going to call G tilde. And G tilde is really just the Yukawa coupling connecting a spectacle to two lambdas or as a you know, diagram looking at it the way you're used to looking at it, would be a conjugate lambda observing a sector fork and coming in. But this G effective, or I call it G tilde over here, is, well, sorry, let, let's talk about how big this thing should be. So there are two things that, that enter. One is what's the sort of amplitude for any Baryonic state to be produced, whether it's lambda lambda or sigma plus sigma minus or whatever, from this configuration. And the this is supposed to sort of visualize that the spectrophore is smaller than the two lambdas. Moreover, the lambdas have an intrinsic, extremely strong hardcore repulsion, just like the nucleons in a nucleus. So the potential between them to try to compress two baryons closer than around half a fermi between their centers gets extremely strong. That's just what holds nucleons. And so this is sort of the potential that you would imagine exists. And if you're at, if it's if these six quarks are in a di lambda state, for example, this would be their characteristic. And to be in the sector state, it's in here. 
And so basically, it's a straightforward calculation given that we did it with a student at Cabrera Zacharias long ago um, to calculate this overlap. And it comes out to be astoundingly small. It's something like within this gray area is the theory prediction, and it's less than 10 to the minus seven. And it's just the geometry of demanding that you have to have a fluctuation, a coordinated fluctuation of six quarks into which are whose centers of mass are separated by more than order a half a G uh, Fermi, and they have to start to fluctuate into this uh, all, all together to the center and be in this. So I won't repeat it. That's why it's unintuitively small. Um, but then you can put non logical constraints, which I knew that this didn't do very well. Um, and this region, for example, in the turquoise, you can exclude using uh, snow data, which starts to limit the rate of V going to SE nu to as a point to that. And there are various other constraints. This, these constraints, this is. Um, this is sort of the region that the H dot, the, oh, let's see, what am I want to show you? Oh, this thing in green called formation time of hypernuclei, that's what ruled out the H, because in the picture of the H, it was, there was no G tilde suppression um, that you would expect. And people showed that you could, they could make uh, wonderful experiments at K10 and Brookhaven where they would send in, I was going to get it wrong, a K plus. And you get a K minus out or back vice versa, and you leave, you swap two down quarks to two strange quarks. So you have a nucleus to two lambdas. And then you ask, do I see the decay products of those lambdas? And answer yes. And so that tells you, places a limit on the formation time of, uh, of the state, the, the H divarian or the F. And that formation time would be very fast in the. H Iberian picture, much faster than the production of the lambdas. And so that's the experiment that really excludes the H. But it's the predicted uh, formation time is very, very, very much slower in the, the scenario with the effective. There's another surprising factor, uh, which is that actually the overlap of the states, the two lambdas is small, but I'll, I'll save that for discussion offline. Okay. Um, but what exactly leads to that shape that potential? Like, is there some attractive force that turns on? Here, where there are lambdas, then this this um, this part out here beyond the dot point five center is actually measured in uh, well, it's partly measured by nuclear physics for nucleons, but it's also measured directly in how CCD measurements of potential between two lambdas. And so at large, relatively large separations where they can be identified as two lambdas, that's actually measured and it goes, uh, it gets big at around the half a center. That's this high core repulsion. It was omega then, exchangers, omega exchanger. What makes the hard core repulsion? No, it's omega. It's essentially Fermi statistic. It's very interesting. It's because, um, I mean, we can discuss this after. Of course, you know about the hard core repulsion that makes nuclei not compressible. And that, however, works is because to make nucleons on top of each other, you would violate Fermi statistics with just the up down degrees of freedom. But with the extra strange quark degree of freedom, you can put them on top of each other. Yeah, but isn't there an omega exchange that's uh, going to supply the repulsive? component that's that's part i mean i i don't i mean it's sort of i think omega and some of the others are what causes this shape but i don't think omega exchange does the real repulsion but maybe it can be understood that way too yeah. uh, are you going to comment on the relic of the spot yes well i can tell you what it is uh because there's two different relic abundance things the i mean relic abundance centers twice um, one is, can you calculate the relic abundance? The way it's formed is different from other relics because it's sort of the idea is that it's energetically favorable. And so, when the even above the QCD hadron transition, 
it's energetically favorable. And so there will actually be a larger population. The, the, it's, it's, it's energetically favorable for two S's to be in strange port, to be in a sexy port, then in the six months. That lets you estimate the relative abundance. But after you're in the hot hydronic phase, if the if this amplitude were big, if it were the effective for order one, let's say, like it would be for regular hadrons, if it weren't for this geometrical suppression, then it would break up because above about um, I want to say 80, I'm forgetting now the exact number, but there's some energy range where it's energetically favorable to be two baryons instead of the S, given the mass in this range. Therefore, in order for it not to be broken up, for it to remain the dark matter, this uh, G tilde has to be below that line. And so, in fact, in, in your expectation is that that would be the generic which is to Is that for the, the uh, getting from the initial thermal abundance to uh, to a, to, well, it's not really even a thermal abundance that you're starting with. The picture, I guess I, I, I uh, kind of left those off. Well, maybe I come back to, to how you estimate the relative abundance. But the picture is that at high temperatures, let's say 150 MeV, when you're sort of making the transition between virtual and plasma and just hot hadrons. Um, as it's cooling, the the question is, do the if you've made you can estimate pretty well within a factor of a few what the right of what the abundance of these relic hexaports will be uh, just as you're making the transition and you get I say within the you certainly get the right order magnitude of answer. But then as it cools, simple thermal collisions uh my, um, I call this S K goes to um, sigma and uh, I'm sorry. Uh, there are no, there are no anti S's around, I guess, though, right? Oh no! In fact, in the early universe, there's a lot of anti S's. The there's the um, the Baryon asymmetry would also apply to the S anti S. But for example, right, but it, at uh, a few hundred MeV, there's there's no there are no anti protons really anymore, right? Oh, yes, there are. Yeah, there are. I, I, we can go through it. It's absolutely and down to around, I want to say, 60 or 70 MeV, maybe 80 when the anti proton screens are on. So let's see if I can draw a diagram. Oh, yeah, have, that's right. An S, and if it could. 20 MeV. So I want to be dry to So here's an S, and losing it is a lambda and an anti lambda. This is the G tilde of this thing. Now you could have a K on come in, let's say, and turn this into a sigma. And a reaction like this keeps the S in thermal equilibrium if, I mean, if this is big enough. And if if it's in thermal equilibrium, then in this hot hydronic phase, Boltzmann statistic favors it's favors the uh, divariant state rather than the sexual. And so, therefore, if this is not too, this is a border one, you you would lose all of the uh, all of your dark matter, and and that's what that dotted line is. As long as G tilde is lower than that, the rate of this is negative relative to the So you don't lose the dark matter. What's that B parameter that you had in the theory, the theory lines? Did you mention what the B was? I, I guess the, the green? Yeah, the B. The B. B, the B point of four five and B equals zero. Five. B is a parameter of uh, if you if you were to phenomenologically model the size um, the, this overall population depends on the size of the and if you model its size 
by um, fitting, right? It's all of the very lines have a size that's big compared to their upper wavelength, presumably because they have a halo of ions and whatnot. And so what I did was fit all of the baryons to, um, you know, their radius is equal to their Compton wavelength plus B times the Compton wavelength of the lightest meson they can couple to. And B of 0.45 fits all of the rest of the baryons. So it's kind of a, an estimate. So that gives you, uh, predicts an S uh, radius that's around 0.35. It turns out recently, in this work uh, with Dana and Hatsuda, we came up with a potential model based on the Cornell potential whose solution gives 0.3 fermions. So I was quite happy, I, even though I, I really, it gives me the creeps to um, apply potential models to systems like this. Okay, let me, uh, any other questions? Well, again, to be speedy, Grossly, once you pass through the quadratic phase, then it just acts, uh, they're very neutral and inert, and they basically act like regular cold dark matter, but with a residual cross section with baryon. And what can that do? Actually, it, well, one thing it can do is wipe out small scale structure. And there are various uh, cosmological tests for that, especially the Lyman alpha chorus. And so, if you assume that the Lyman alpha chorus had to be primordially uh, generated, then that would place constraints that would dip down into here about halfway, maybe not quite that far. But um, in fact, the, saying that that, 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 the, that doesn't prove that the Lyman alpha chorus was formed that way, and other people have ideas for what form the Lyman alpha chorus. And in that case, uh, they, this this is not a. But somehow one doesn't need to discuss this. I don't want to go into too much detail. One of the interesting things that you may know that um, there's this evidence in cosmology now of very massive, very high redshift black holes. So Thing like a dozen of them or more, but I'm talking about masses like 10 to the ninth or 10 to the 10th solar mass holes at redshifts of seven or eight. And this has been a very big puzzle for cosmologists. And this may be um, helped by there being a baryonic and we'll go into it, it will never get to the most exciting part of the talk. And similarly, there's various implications where. Uh, Hadronically interacting dark matter could account for some observations in, um, in astrophysics, like galaxy clusters, why they stay so, why they don't uh, cool more drastically. And but the thing is, what hadron physics will do all by itself is still so difficult to model that it's not at all clear whether you need help from the dark matter or not. But it's interesting that it may help. Okay, I'm going to shift gears entirely and talk about G minus two. And I'm going to dwell a little bit on it just because it's so beautiful. But of course, everyone has seen the picture of this uh, uh, storage ring, which was originally built, I, well, I think it was originally built in any event, this last use before going to Fermi Lab was just Brookhaven, where they did the previous measurement, the best measurement of G minus two. And the way the measurement works is that you compare. So the omega, omega A here is the anomalous so called anomalous precession frequency of the muon. And what is that? As the muon travels one time around, its momentum vector rotates by two pi. At the same time, if g minus two were zero, where g is the uh, magnetic moment predicted by Dirac, then its spin would also persist exactly two pi. And so the thing you have to do to measure the anomalous magnetic moment is to measure what the actual precession frequency is, and that is by this formula, Related to the magnetic field 
that the um, new one is, is in. And also other things like this gamma factor. Gamma is just you know, the energy divided by the mass of the muon. And beta is the velocity of the muon. Anyway, the amazing thing to keep in mind is the precision of the experiment now is a third of a part per million. And you say, how, can, how is that possible? Well, the crucial piece, I can talk about what's the direction of the muons yet. And so the first crucial thing that makes this possible is that the highest energy electrons that emerge from muon decay, their um, momentum tends to align, not perfectly, of course, as a distribution, but it peaks in the direction of the muon spin. And so all around here, you can even see them, are detectors, which this was sort of sketched in here, where they're detecting um, the electrons that emerge from this decay. And what's going to happen is, and then they watch uh, the, in each one of these counters, how the uh, amplitude is changing. They have to, because the gamma tau is 60 or so microseconds, you have to refill 16 times in every 1.4 seconds. And so it's because the muons are decaying away. And then oh, there's a nice trick here that when you already know that they knew quite well. And so they tune the gamma to make this coefficient zero. So you don't have to worry about any stray electrons. Of course, they try to keep these small. And they aim the magnetic field very precisely to be vertical relative to the um, velocity to make this term down. So that's the sort of general strategy. I probably wanted to say about it, but I thought it was good to let students appreciate the, the beauty of that, the fact that we can even do an experiment like this. So in the standard model, well, you calculate the new on the longest moment um, by considering all the radiative corrections to the, this is the zero order diagram, which gives you the Bragg um, values. One loop is here, then you add two loop diagrams, you could have this decorated with other photons and so on and so on. And amongst the uh, contributions, there's a high enough order, there's, you have a diagram like this, where you've got a loop of all the charged particles in the theory, because this is a photon. In fact, people include the uh, W and Zs and so on, but this is the only one that matters a lot when there's a photon. And so you have to calculate that loop, and that's duck soup for the electrons. But when that's a clock in the loop, all sorts of complicated hadronic interactions, non perturbative interactions, modify this amplitude. And so, although this looks like a perturbative thing that a theorist can write down very easily, in reality, due to gluons, this thing is extremely hard to. Uh, analyze. Serendipitously, I'll come back to this in more detail later, there's this marvelous uh, dispersion relations that lets you relate that to an integral over the total cost section for E plus E minus goes to QQ bar into anything. And so QQ bar, once that's produced, makes head. So the idea is that you can measure this thing that you need to predict C minus two by measuring E plus A minus goes to Hadron. And so people did this. This shows, um, I'm sorry, I didn't, this is from an Iwana at all paper. I'm happy to give you citations later. But this was a group of something like 140 people who studied all of the different experiments for E plus A minus the Hadrons and came up with a consensus value for what this thing is. And this is talking about all the different contributions to uh, G minus two. And far and away, the biggest uh, contributions are purely QED, and that's the contribution it makes. And then this is, you, you can see the electroweak is there, it's not zero, but it's quite precise. The big uncertainty comes from this so-called, this is called the hadronic vacuum polarization. Hadronic because it's hadron 
And they assign, this is its contribution, and that's the uncertainty they assign to it. And then there's other contributions, this had one of the light and so on and so on. But this is the discrepancy then they find. And by the way, this paper was made before the Fermi lab. But the Fermi lab G minus two agrees pretty well with the book even G minus two. There were the mirrors. Fermi lab number makes the discrepancy a bit bigger. But in this particular table, this is smaller than the present day discrepancy. But just you see that the discrepancy that exists is a few percent, so a few percent of the contribution of the hadronic vacuum polarization. Um, let's see, maybe I said most of this. This is a so if you, I'm going to come back a lot for the students in case you don't already know it. There's this terminology called the R ratio, it's sometimes called R hat, and it's the cross section at a given set of mass energy for E plus D minus the beta hadrons divided by the Born approximation for E plus D minus the Elon, just so that it's not wildly test um, dependent. And then this is a formula for the contribution. This hadronic vacuum polarization makes to the muon anomalous magnetic moment. It depends on some this function k, which basically is taking into account the fact that you're doing a loop integral there. Anyway, that's the, the expression in terms of this thing. Uh, I, I sometimes denoted R hat. So everybody's with me on that. Um, so just for orientation, this is what the R hat looks like this is the sigma hat these this is falling rapidly because overall it's falling like uh the, the muon cross section looks like one of the mass um and this is converting from the cross section to this r you see that r is in the vicinity of a few but at certain resonances it gets really big and something like 75 percent of the contribution, uh, the total contribution to the vacuum polarization, it comes from the rho meson and another 6% from the phi. Um, these higher contributions are suppressed because this falls like one of the S is the center of mass energy. This is blowing up. Uh, more precisely, these each different energy range, so you can see more clearly. Just recently, and some of you may not know this, because it, I don't know how widely it impacted people outside the community, an experiment at Novus Adverse called CMD, CMD3, it's the third generation of the CMD collaboration, they remeasured the um, E plus E minus the pi pi for energies less than about a GeV. And they put out this paper in February. And according to them, this is the old data, the central value was, so this is their new value of the contribution in this very limited uh, center of mass energy range which is um, you know, dominated by the row. And you see, they get a lot bigger value than the previous experiment. And, and uh, the reason they, they well, they have a lot more statistics, a detector with better momentum resolution. And so they were able to analyze the final states and they concluded that approximation, the theoretical approximation that was being applied to the analysis by all the other experiments that it breaks down in certain kinematic regions, they were able to test using the forward backward asymmetry uh, the fiducial volume. So, an important part of this is they don't see every final pion, they see a subset of the pion. And so, very important to know what you're missing. That's what you could call it a fiducial volume calculation. And they were able to again discover that the previous ones were not quite right, and they were able to test it because they had some better statistics. 
And also, and I think for theorists, this is a really important thing to keep in mind, they discovered that the standard approximation for doing the high order QED uh, part contributions, were, I didn't know this, people treat the photon as a scalar, that that is actually not a good approximation. It's not a surprise, it's not a perfect approximation, but it turns out to be a not good approximation on the level that interprets can contribute. Anyway, making all of these modifications, they arrive at a value that's about 15 larger than the consensus value for this particular region. So um, before that, <laughs> so this plot is showing this sort of A mu. And by the way, in different papers, people multiply the actual uh, anomalous moment by different things. Sometimes it's 10 to the 9, sometimes it's 10 to the 10, sometimes it's 10 to the 11. I'm trying to adopt 10 to the 10. But in that case, this is the uh, Brookhaven value rewritten as a measurement of this hadronic vacuum polarization. This was the existing R ratio uh, results. These were the lattice results at the time that this, these experiments were done. The same day that this was came out, the, oh, I'm not gonna remember the initials again. Anyway, BMW is a group of lattice Budapest, 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 in, in Germany. Budapest, 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 they found this number, which was consistent. Well, then I guess it's two and a half sigma in the experiment. And you know, nobody would worry for that kind of difference. Um, and what had happened was the earlier lattice uh, results were just way too disparate to be weighing in. But with Wuppertal, and then subsequently, um, the paper that has a good summary that according here, is the so-called EMC for, or each EMC, European Twisted Muon Collaboration. It, 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 this has to do with technical details of how you do the fermions on the lattice. But anyway, they compile all the uh, lattice experiments and they say they're 4.2 sigma away from the E plus E minus data and consistent with G minus two. So according to them, then if you count, if you do, Lattice gauge theory, you agree with G minus two, there's no discrepancy, but you have this big problem with the direct E plus A minus data. Um, I, I also, that's just going into more detail of the um, experiment. So a year ago, after hearing a talk by Gokhan Fodor of the BMW group, I said, oh, you know, how do we make sense of the fact that BMW is getting a different answer for the hadronic vacuum polarization than uh, the E plus E minus data, right? You could always imagine it's not actually that easy to find new physics that's not already excluded by other things that can explain the discrepancy with G minus two, but at least with G minus two, you think there could be new physics. But here, BMW, who just went out of physics, why are they, how can they be getting a different answer than um, E plus A minus. But CMD3 pretty much agrees with the BMW, right? It's, it's just the difference. There's, it reduces the discrepancy by that. There's still a residual in these units, uh, there's a residual 10 or 15 units, but you wouldn't worry about that. That you say is two or two and a half sigma. Absolutely. So if um, CMD3, had existed a year ago, I probably would never have gotten in any other talk because I would have said, oh, that's two sigma. But it didn't exist then. And so I was scratching my head and said, is there conceivably anything that could reconcile the BMW lattice results with the then uh, E plus E minus results? Um, and so the natural thing to think is that 
if the R ratio is low, could there be something that's contributing to the R ratio that's been missed in the experiment? So then the question becomes, and it has to be hadronic if we're going to reconcile the inconsistency with the lab results. And so in fact, I started reading the, the experimental papers and just thinking, and I realized that indeed there is. And in fact, it's almost a miracle that more hasn't been missed. But the, the reason for this is the following. Um, this is an example from Babar, which shows the detector. And to orient you to the problem, the, in Babar, the so-called physics channels, which were the uh, leptons and all the hadrons, have a, a rate of 65 events per second. Lava scattering, this E plus or minus E, E is nearly 10 times as big. And then this is the killer, just the backgrounds from the beam interacting with stuff. Not at E plus E minus collision at all, but the beam interacting with gas in the uh, accelerator or glancing off some magnet or something produces an event rate that's 20,000 hertz. That immediately lets you realize that they have to do very strong suppression with, in effect, triggers or event selection. And so, just to give you an example, the classic experiment uh, that, like, discovered the Jake Psi and Crystal Ball and all these ones that people may remember, either demanded two charged particles from the collision point or at least both two photons consistent with the pi zero coming from the collision point. So if you had some other process, as you know, I was thinking sexoport production, because sexoports being a long-lived neutral particle won't be decaying right in the volume. So they won't produce charged particles or pions in the, uh, in the detector. And so these just wouldn't be uh, recorded or analyzed. So then I went through all of the experiments. It's a big job. Um, and I mean, I won't take the time. I'm getting short, uh, but I can come back if people want. Uh, each one of them places some kind of condition on the acceptable final state that would exclude SS bar production or things of that ilk. Uh, typically, they demand that 35% of the beam energy should appear as activity in their detector, like charged pions or pi zeros, um, or that the two hemispheres, never any two hemispheres you could pick for your event, they'll never differ in the energy deposit by more than uh, 10 or 15 percent and so on. So, um, so then I started to look to see, well, could the rate be big enough to be of interest and fill this gap? And now, in my opinion, we should probably accept CMD3. Um, it certainly seems like a better even though there's a whole lot of other experiments, I would say let's we should accept that. And so then the discrepancy is now smaller. So I have that. Um, but I, I just checked of what kind of cross sections would you need for it to work? And they come out, you know, totally reasonable. And so then the question is, how could you actually look for these things? So one way to so that this is a challenge. You want to be looking for E plus E minus into all the possible final states and not impose that the final states are the ones that we would expect from the known hadrons. A perfect way is to do what's called ISR, that's for initial state radiation. And in that technique, you, for example, this is especially well developed for upsilon decays, uh, for experiments that sit on the upsilon. So there's an extremely high event rate. And then they look for a photon, a hard photon, such that the actual E plus E minus annihilation occurs at a lower center of mass energy. And this is the relation. So knowing the photon energy and the beam energy, um, you know the center of mass energy exists. It turns out to be very hard because there's, again, lots of background to deal with. Babar actually used it for a 
limit, which is related, but actually would not apply, and they're trying to redo it. The other idea, which is now what I want to tell you about, I hope it'll be okay if I go a minute or two over, um, is that looking at high precision data on E plus E minus can give us a handle on this hyaline vacuum filter. I didn't get my uh, my um, iPad organized to make a new plot, but the part of this plot you're supposed to look at is just this with a E plus E minus on this side and a mu plus mu minus on that side. Okay, that's the idea. The same diagram will be one of the contributions. Um, and here's the expression. So with uh, Peng Zhang Luan, uh, we've looked at this uh, at this process because he's an experimentalist on that. Mara Carliner knew him and suggested I talk to him. And then um, Mark has been sort of peripherally involved. He may or may not uh, consider that he's done enough of actual work to join us on the paper. But anyway, um, this is the data that we are using. And uh, yeah, so this is this thing called R mu, which is basically the ratio of the actual E plus E minus to mu plus E minus divided by the volume constant. Um, so this is their data. This is the prediction in red from the observed uh, hadronic cross section. So we see the actual, so this is what we need. That's, that's what this thing is. And this, this hadronic piece contribution is also the leptonic loop, so I'm not writing. Um, the hadronic piece is just given by the integral of the hadronic. So if you look at straight, make the uh, fit, it's, it's very far off. On the other hand, the absolute normalization difference between this and this is within their uncertainty on the, on the normalization. Um, uh, and, and if you allow for an uncertainty in the normalization, the red is the predicted uh, fit from this. Um, now, looking at so the data, we took great care to restrict to so what we're going to need to do is ask, is the energy dependence of the data consistent with the predicted energy dependence? We're not going to worry about the overall normalization because uh, that part has this sort of percent uncertainty. Um, and so we want to be sure, as sure as one can be, that there's no energy dependence to the systematic. So we took the data that had been taken all within the same general time frame, which was less than a six month period. And the blue points are so-called scan data, where there's something like 104 different energies separated by 8 MeV, and they took I'm going to not remember the total uh, integrated luminosity on each one of them. And then they had five additional data points, which were taken at very high luminosity. You can, can you see the little green points? They have much higher, much smaller error bars. Um, altogether, it was around uh, 3,000 or 2 to 1. So allowing for this overall shift, that's the fit you get. Adopting, uh, you know, doing this integral over the observed hadronic cross section. It is, in fact, although by eye maybe it doesn't look so bad, it's actually a terrible fit. The chi squared per degree of freedom is 239 divided by 108. The confidence level, you know, the probability that you would get such a bad fit on statistical grounds alone is uh, 7, 10 to the minus 12. I mean, it's a terrible, terrible fit. The reason it may not be so apparent is that A, these are very, very small error bars. And so the deviation here is many, many sigma. And importantly, the blue, we could do it. We get a same conclusion about a bad fit, um, whether or not we include the high luminosity points and just use the blue points, for example. So that's totally consistent um, with the data. Now, what we've done is say, well, what if we added to the, um, well, I should have, 
shown in the picture. But the, the idea now is to imagine adding the, the cross section plus and minus those hadrons. Imagine her acting out a picture here. Oh, oh, shoot. I don't know what I did. In my attempt to add a few slides, I may have actually lost one. That's a bummer. Um, well, anyway, what we imagine doing is adding to this cross section one or two resonances that we just don't know about. And we allow their um, seriously. We allow, we consider two cases that there was one more resonance or two more resonance. And uh, we put them to be bright figures with a mass and a width and an E plus E minus width. And one uh, bright figure gives you the this bit, it improves the fit a lot, but two bright figures gives you a great fit on a confidence level of 35%. The significance of the first. Resonance is 8.2 sigma. That's significant. And the significance of the second resonance is 6.5 sigma. So statistically speaking, this is extremely robust. The question would be, in my mind, could there be some conspiracy of the systematics that could induce an energy dependent but reproducible energy dependence that happens to be well fit by the two resonances. Um, we, we might come back to that. I hope, oh shoot, I was going to show you a picture of what it, what those resonances would do to the cross section. Um, what they would look like is a contribution that looks a lot like um, psi to dv bar. So it's very much in the uh, realm of the other resonances, what, what these new resonances would be like. Um, well, afterwards, for people who are interested, I'll just look at um, One can say, what could such new resonances be? We can say immediately a couple of things. One is they have to. Um, G1 minus minus, like the vector meson, so they wouldn't couple the photons. They have to have a charge component or they wouldn't couple the photons. Um, the, uh, they have to be fairly long lived, or they would have decayed in, um, right? If they were too short lived, then their decay products would have shown up and they wouldn't have missed all the rest of the stuff. Um, the particles that they decay into have to be neutral and they again have to be pretty long lived. So the S would be great. And I've not been able to think of any other candidates that could be long lived or not. Um, so it seems like you have to have a conserved quantum number to come up with something. Um, but like I say, I tried hard to think of alternatives and I didn't find them. The masses come out very nicely if you wanted to do a sex support, anti sex support resonance production. In this picture, the R1 and R2 would be um, resonances that are decaying in the S. Um, the, um, in the plot I don't have for you, I calculated two things. One was what is the contribution to it, with with these resonance fit, what is the contribution to a mu? And fascinatingly, it's exactly what you need to make up the shortfall after you put in CMD3. Uh, I wouldn't have worried about that shortfall, but this really does just plot right in there. And the other thing is that it increases, I'll show you super interested. It does increase the alpha at the Z because it changes the running of, of the electromagnetic system um, in a way that, that, that can be compatible or maybe even improve the fit, or given the uncertainties on the parameters of the resonances, it can increase it enough that it makes the electroweak tensions even more severe. Anyway, what could this thing be? Well, if it were a dark photon, that's been excluded by Bevel. 
if it's some sort of neutral composite, but it's beyond the standard model, that's very challenging. It means the beyond the standard model particles have to carry a border unit electric charge. Otherwise, you can't get enough coupling to be produced in E plus or minus. Um, and so this seems to me very dangerous, but I don't have a proof it can't be done. Maybe some uh, ingenious person can discover a way to do it and beyond the standard. And uh, it, 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 they can't obviously have isospin partners um, or flavor partners, or you would have seen them as charged particles. Um, this was the I'll skip over that. Over that. I'm going to show you the last meeting. I guess I destroyed it. No, here it is. This was from Kokenberg again. <laughs> I think I just got there. I bought it in here, maybe. <laughs> Before we knew about the best results, I guess that could. I'll, I'll have to send in our paper as soon as it's finished to see if we can kind of add. So the, the S is, you're taking it to be a singlet state, I guess. Yes, that's very crucial. Because if you if it weren't this flavor singlet, all sorts of things would change and it would get ruled out. Because, for example, then it would have ion coupling, and then it would have strong interaction, and then it would have charged partners. But presumably there are excited states as well. Yes, and I, that's something I want to work on. And isn't wouldn't that be some way of verifying or detecting it? Because you could, I would imagine, if you produce a, an excited state, it's maybe not that different in mass. Um, I, I tried to estimate it. So another part of the story was how to understand it in terms of lattice PCB. And, that whole exploration led us to a potential model where, so it turns out, I didn't go into this because it's kind of subtle. In order to create a totally anisymmetric particle, it can't be factorizable in the two color singlets exclusively. And when you include, when you then include that and say, oh, let me use a Cornell potential for the octet octet part then you can do things like predict the excited states. And, and also you predict this 0 0.3 fermion radius. But it, as I remember, the spacing between the excited states is 200 MeV or so. Okay. So that's uh, that puts them fairly high, but it's still- No, no, but it's not that high. It's, it's not like four, it's not like, it's not like double the, its mass. Right, right, right. But so, but wouldn't you produce them in E plus E minus as well? And they would decay. Right, so wouldn't you be well, able to would be more like making? I mean, you wouldn't make like think about making sigma plus sigma minus that exists, but it's an exclusive reaction, it's very small. So, the, the direct production, as opposed to being the decayed product of a resonance, is much, much smaller. So, for example, um, right, PP bar is measured, but there's no resonance that I'm aware of which directly decays with any significant branching fraction in the PP bar. It's just seen in the continuum. So I think this excited part of the excited states will be seen in the continuum. And I'm sure you're right that they would be there. I didn't give them any thought, but I guess that because I'll have one they don't, You don't produce deltas or something? Or no, I think people, I don't know if they've reconstructed deltas, but you certainly see PP bar pi plus pi minus. So maybe, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I'm just thinking of the analog of that, right? So, you, like with PP bar, you go to protons, you produce a delta, which decays to the proton. Here, you would produce some excited S, which would decay to S. But what would be the mechanism of making? I think what all I'm trying to say is if you made SS bar in some. Um, so, the, so, like, if you're thinking about the PP bar. You have a, a photon here, and then you would make a U, U bar quark, let's say, and then you have to right. sort of simultaneously make the extra. Uh, yeah. And then you get a, a, a four factor. 
Sure. The way you avoid the form factor penalty is when it's the decay products of the resonance. And so if you're talking about making this new state exclusively, you so, would have this. So how are you making the S? More like a row where you, you make the, um, it has a, a port components. And by the way, something that enhances the um, production is the fact that it's very small. The, uh, the vector dominance model for uh, like to the row, to how people would model the row, the photon converts to a row, and then the row decays to stuff, pi plus, pi minus. They're in special because they're so low in the paper. But here, if you, so you would have the same, um, and then in this amplitude goes like the wave function of the origin squared, because that is sort of clear. Um, and so being a factor of three smaller in size gives you a, a benefit of all the factors for you. Um, anyway, but that would be the idea that it's, um, you would take an S and an S bar because there would be all these other uh, Right, so, but it is an excited state. It's just that you're getting some extra angular momentum, relative angular momentum. Right? It's, it's the, well, I, it's a question of what you the masses of the R1 and R2. I was imagining you were talking about the same. It's the R1 and R2 are just a few hundred MeV above uh, the SS bar. Oh, okay. And so there are four point four and four point seven. And so if you had to go another six hundred MeV higher to make, let's say, S star S star bar, where these were the excited charge side excited states. Then you would have to be way beyond the peak of the lesson. But it's a very nice point. I should definitely think about it. You know what's fascinating when you look at the data, um, there's almost the data can not think of back to the uh, peak of the bar. I'm so sorry I didn't hear. Well, this is an example. Uh, the real data. Let me see it. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to show you that here. So you see what a mess this is? There's almost no data in there. And it's all over the place. So among other things, I think as you're the positive one that's saying we should, we should know better what's happening in that data. But certainly there could be stuff there that's never been measured. So yeah. I have a question about the symmetry here. Yeah. I mean, QCD just has one scale. So if you identify something that's long lived, then it should be some kind of symmetry. Can you identify a symmetry for why this is yeah. really such a long? And but it's not just baryon number, right? Because uh, you also have to, it's also kinematics, right? Because you're putting this thing right in the, right in the sweet spot. Sorry, which are you talking about now? The Mars or the S? Oh, the S, the S. Well, so the mass of the S is, let's say it's two GeV. And that mass, its lifetime will be of order more than the age of universe by many factors. And it's for two reasons. One is it has to have two baryons in a finite state. If it's that massive, it can't decay to, and if it's that light, it can't decay to lambda neutron, which if it were over 2.05 GeV, it could go to lambda neutron. And then its lifetime would be a of years. But when it's got both doubly weak and what, and this G tilde is small, then you get these enormously. Yeah, but it seems incredibly tuned, right? I mean, why does QCD just put a, I mean. It, it's, it's, it's not so much QCD as just the kinematics, right? It, it would be it would be stable if it was lighter than uh, 1890. Mm -hmm. And see. once you once you get into the regime, it has to be doubly weak. I don't know if you've ever seen doubly weak decays, have they? Of anything because there, I don't, I can't think of anything for which that's not totally overwhelmed by something else. But here it would be the only chance. Mm -hmm. 
there's a strange number. Also, Sorry? there's a strange number in you in your S state, and you also are deeply bounded state. You assume so yeah, absolutely naturally, naturally it's slightly below the double lambda. So, yeah. That part is right. Being below double lambda would have even been true for the A set variant, but it would have had a lifetime of 10 minutes, 10 seconds. So it's a combination of things. The mass is crucial not be above 2.05. Interestingly, when we do the fit for what the mass of the secondary is, we got 1.9 GeV. It's got big error bars. I, I didn't I kill it. But anyway, um, it's a, to, my belief is that we're so unable to really calculate PCD unless we already know the answer. <laughs> you know, speaking as a theorist, um, people make so many models, which get invariably thrown out when data comes in. And so keeping a little humble point of view, I agree it's a qualitative argument. Could it be as small as 0.37? A lot of people would say, well, that's ridiculous. And, but I don't think we, I don't think, personally, I don't think we understand PCD well enough to have confidence. Yeah, but beyond the beyond the kinematics, you don't have any other theoretical arguments. Then that's basically what you say. Yeah, what happens is you might say the kinematics induces effect that drive you many orders of magnitude in terms of G Fermi, right? When you go from uh, G Fermi squared to G Fermi to the fourth, it makes a big impact. Or if you were even just 100 MeV or so lighter, then it's totally forbidden. That variant. So I wouldn't call that accidental. So, you know, Blake, I, I, I am trying. Uh, the thing to, to keep in mind is that the um, binding energy is relatively small compared to the lambdas, its median is about 13%. And that's not a particularly strong binding. Certainly, that's tiny compared to the effects we attribute to chiral symmetry breaking and the mistakes we make in other sectors of hadron physics. Uh, sorry, there was a- Arcadi had a question. Oh, Arcadi, how are you? Yeah. How are you? Can I see? Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm doing uh, okay, you can see me, but you are hiding yourself. Uh, but the, oh, okay. the, <laughs> the camera's there. Yeah. The camera's on the back wall. Oh, yeah. maybe you stand in the center. Yeah. Uh, no, my, uh, I'm trying to to follow, you know, this kind of um, comparison with the latest to some extent. So, um, I'm sorry, it's a little hard to hear. You. Sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to follow the comparison between the latest and the the latest and the latest yeah, so so what I wonder about the volume, let's say that we are talking about uh, a, a slow, uh, a slow no, I mean, strong interaction, so it's QCD stuff, not 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 BSM, not 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 right. uh, new physics. Okay, okay. so then uh, let's say as a as a current situation, you know, if I'm uh, looking at this latest stuff and uh, uh, CMD three stuff so so we see that instead of say like four sigma we have kind of two sigma right difference and this um uh, in, uh, raise in uh hadronic uh integral uh, uh integral of hadronic uh, production cross section um i mean direction to uh, the same direction which lattice predicts but lattice predicts not just um g minus two lattice predicts integral over uh, hadronic cross section and you can try to to play different windows there so so essentially it is prediction for integral certain type of integral of uh, e plus e minus two hadrons in different range okay and my understanding was that in certain way you can kind of play with this latest calculation to see uh, where uh, they're predicting, you know, kind of enhancement of uh, as compared with uh, experimental uh, R value. Where pre so so in this way, when you are saying that it could be from the range of I don't know four GV or whatever high range, it means that um, it means that the cross section uh, in um, 
not contrib contribution to G minus two would be say responsible for remaining two sigma, for example, right? So, so you have four sigma, two sigma is compensated by increasing in CMD three, but let's say you're saying another two sigma is sitting higher up. But uh, when they see, uh, but the integral in G minus two is conversion integral. So it means that the cross section itself uh, absolute cross section in this, uh, say, 4GV, whatever, should be um, no, uh, uh, kind of increased, right? Because, uh, you know, the integral was conversion. Uh, 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 so, uh, and, and I'm trying to understand that if I'm using latest calculation for this uh, kind of higher region of masses, so my, my guess would be that they would uh, put a, a limb, um, you know, this window for higher uh, range, uh, which could limit, uh, you know, this um, part you are talking about, like production of this resonance. Uh, so, so not because they, they are predicting any resonances, but uh, they would be predicting uh, QCD integrals for this range. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I if, I, if I heard you and I understand you. Let me show you a plot. Can I get back onto uh, somehow disconnected, I think, or you, you, because, uh, no, what I'm trying to say is that in this way, they have limitation for production at higher range of masses. I mean, higher range of energies. Uh, and it is independent on G minus two, it's just uh, by itself. Something sure enough. Sorry, just a second, everybody. I'm trying to get a slide here. It's like, so don't, don't, I'll check on my screen, but I want to, no. project this on that screen. We see something at the top. Uh, uh, Are you not mirroring anymore? Range? I, I, it's, your menu bar is up there. I see. So you think that I, I don't know how I happen to get. Did you move? So is it a mirror? Let me see. Yeah, yeah. Up. yeah up. there it is. It's down. You pushed it down. There it is. Go up more, more. No, up, up more. I don't, I'm now I'm not. Oh, I so see. that's but that's an overleaf file. That's fine. That's what I. Oh, that's what you want. I'm looking for the. <laughs> okay, so this is this paper that's been published. Um, I think this will. I so I really I I think I got the drift, Arkady, and I absolutely would agree. I even said it. Um, I don't know if you were here that if I had known about CMB three. A year ago, I probably never would have pursued thinking about this. And now I don't think there's a strong motivation, it's only two sigma, to invent new stuff. However, as a result of thinking along this line and realizing it could be there, we started analyzing the E plus E minus. And so now I say, let's look at that because it seems to be telling us there are references. At least that's the straightforward interpretation. So I showed they fits. This is from this, this paper that's on the wall. I already showed the fits to the um, data with the, this is the one that gives really an outstanding fit, uh, essentially perfect uh, chi squared. And now what I can do is I can ask things like, so here's the parameters of the fit. That's this one that looks like that. Um, I can say, for instance, this is showing a quite a wide, uh, the second resonance is very wide. I can say, how well is that constrained? And this is showing the width is, it, it's, it likes a big width, but basically it's unconstrained because the uh, best data ends at 4.6 uh, GeV. So I think you can say that its width is going to be bigger than a border 100 MeV, and that's about it. What this is showing for orientation is what it would do to the R value if we could see it. And that's perfectly kind of conventional. And then you can calculate what does it do to uh, the, what, what would, would, would that people be doing hydronic type controllization? Um, so we can calculate, and uh, there's a plot here, I think. I hope it's at least I just pop at the top. There it is. This is the uh, as a so right where 
doing a fit, and so that is a multiple parameters, and so you can do the procedure of uh, throwing values of the parameters, and then because um, they're all correlated, and then by the probability, by the there are many different techniques, but anyway, you can calculate the probability of the parameter, and so as a function in that space, what this shows is that. This is the predicted, if you like, probability distribution of the values for a mu from these two new states. And as you were saying, it's a small number. So the typical, the most likely value is around six. So it by, the, by itself, absolutely, without CMD3, would not have done the job that led me to be thinking about this. And so its contribution to a mu is kind of insignificant, I would say. So, but but right, but look, uh, but look, uh, Glenis, uh, Glenis, but I but I'm asking not about contribution to a mu, I'm asking about integral of uh, 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 e plus e minus two hard and cast section, uh, which ladies could predict independently of g minus two. Right, and so that one I didn't finish calculating, but my impression is that it's going to be an excellent agreement because. The certainly when you look at their weighting, um, they're they're getting weight from this region. I don't think it's in contradiction with them at all. They're very no. poor at large. No. Right, large S corresponds to short distance, and short distance is the one they do the least well, because then you get the lattice resolution uh, produces problems for you. So this yeah. I'm sure is consistent, but you're right, I should check that. No, no, but uh, I'm not sure. Look, I am not aware uh, but my, uh, about details of this latest calculation, but I believe that they can calculate integral in certain windows. Let's say that they calculate, uh, you know, integral associated with a windows of where you are expecting this resonance to be. Uh, and uh, and it would be much more sensitive than to what you are, uh, I mean, getting for this resonance because to provide this sufficient uh, contribution to, to a mu, uh, you need uh, a, a relatively large cross-section of production of those, uh, right. you know. It would have been, it, you're absolutely right. Had we tried to explain all of a mu, it would have been very difficult to explain as this region is pointing out, yeah. it would possibly have been in contradiction. But in the end, the fit to the E plus E minus of your new data is requiring a lot smaller contribution. The amount it's contributed to AU is, is rather small, as the plot shows. And correspondingly, but you're right, it's something that we, we need to calculate. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it would be a problem. I had in the original slide, and I guess I can get back to it. Yeah, no, my, my impression was that the, uh, yeah, my impression was that they were kind of uh, consistent with uh, kind of enhancement at, uh, at low energies, but maybe I'm wrong. I, I'm not sure about it's this. Really true. I think it's, it's a sort of, you can say it one way, but not backwards. It's certainly really true that a contribution like CMD3 is very compatible with explaining the discrepancies seen in the hadronic section polarization. And so yet again, if if that's all, you know, if this is where we were a year ago, I, I would not have thought further about it because the CMD3 would both be consistent with the hadronic section, but with a lot of QCD and the C plus or minus data. Okay. But I don't think that this predicts, this doesn't predict a large enough contribution as to present a problem with respect to B plus the, the lattice. But it's, it's, you're right, it, it, it must, we, should, we should calculate that and add, we could add it to this plot that I'm showing here, which shows that it's as a function of the same. We could, we could plot the what's the change in some window function for the lattice QCD. Thank you. We'll add that. Okay. Well, maybe we're 
<laughs> a little over. So maybe well, let's thank Lennis again. Remind you all, there's another talk in about an hour. <laughs> thank you, our I want to know your reaction. Are you intrigued? Okay. Hi, Glenn. Yes, again. Well, I'll have to find out offline what your comments are. So, yeah, so you are not coming to KTP, right? Or you will? I came in December and you didn't reply to me. Maybe you need to. I was hoping to come visit you in Santa Barbara. But maybe uh, I have to be in Santa Cruz in January and July to get. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, it was not easy to hear because uh, this kind of audio does not go through very well. Yeah, so but but now I can see and can enjoy by just seeing you. <laughs> okay, you too. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye, Kenny. Bye.